let's start this video with a quiz. Look at these four equations. E stands for the energy of a body. M stands for the mass of that body. C is the speed of light. If it has a little knot, that stands for rest. So you have rest energy and rest mass in these equations. Which one of these equations is the most correct? It's like SAT style rules, which is the most best equation? Which of these equations was first written down by Einstein? Which of these equations is a direct consequence of the theory of special relativity? Today I'm talking about mass as a concept. I will be presenting to you an argument made by the Soviet theoretical physicist Lev Okun over 30 years. Here's his paper from 1989. Here is his paper from 2008. It would seem that he was not very successful getting his point across because he would ask that same question to an audience of physicists and they would often get it wrong. They would say the correct answer to all those questions you just asked is equals mc squared. When, when that, that's not the correct answer, actually. The correct answer is e naught equals mc squared. So the argument made by Lev Okun is this. There, there is one type of mass. It, it's mass. There, there's no rest mass. There's no relativistic mass. But before we get any farther in this video, I do need to tell you that this is, this is not an Einstein is wrong video. This is not a watch physicist disprove the theory of relative, no, no, no. Einstein was right. The theory of relativity is beautiful and successful. This is not an argument of syntax. This is an argument of semantics. Depending on how you define your terms, all of these equations could be right for some problem. But in the standard definition of E, M, and C, one of these is always correct, and that is E naught equals MC squared. I'm not disproving Einstein. We're not canceling relativity. If you want to watch a video where someone proves Einstein wrong, I would instead suggest you watch my video about crackpots and then learn basic physics and then come back and watch this video. This is an argument about education, how we teach physics to the public, how we teach physics to the people who are just learning physics, and why how we do that can change the perception of a theory and it can lead to misconceptions about a theory which is a problem because we want everyone to have a nice little understanding of relativity. But Einstein was right. The theory of relativity is a good one. One of Lev Okun's accomplishments is that he named the Hadron. In the 60s, when people are starting to talk about strong interactions versus weak interactions, he, what do you know, was like, words are very important. It's almost like Lev Okun, Soviet physicist, made his career on semantics. He was like, we cannot keep talking about weak interactions and strong interactions without naming the type of particle that acts in strong interactions and separating it from those particles that don't. So he said, I'm going to call it a hadron. Anything that interacts with a strong force, so you know, your protons, your neutrons, is a hadron, and we can call them hadronic interaction. And what do you know, hadrons, protons, neutrons, are what make up most of the mass. Nearly all of the mass is protons and neutrons. This guy knows his mass. He also, again with the semantics in the 70s, probably his most famous work with some collaborators were discussing the physics of the vacuum. He was like, you people, you keep saying the word vacuum. I don't think you know what that means. Let me define vacuum. Let me definitively say what physics is like in a vacuum. What is a vacuum and what is it not? And this series of papers from the 70s became very, very important when people actually started planning to measure the Higgs boson. So you know the Large Hadron Collider, Hadron, Mass, Lev Okun, okay. The plan in like 2000 was to be like, we are gonna measure the Higgs boson, we have to build this big, big, giant experiment. And what do you know, the vacuum became very important because when you talk about, oh, this is out of the scope of this video, when you talk about the Higgs field, which, you know, gives mass to particles, you need to understand what the vacuum is and what it is not. Mass, and semantics was this guy's whole business. His very successful research career was built on these two things and he's the perfect person to make this argument about what is mass. 
So we have to do a short history of mass as a concept. If you go to the Wikipedia page, they, they start with like the history of amount. And I think that's very funny. Like you imagine 10,000 years ago, the world's first mathematician sees a guy holding like two guinea fowl in one hand and five in the other. And he's like, that one's got more. That one's more. More is a thing. We can skip ahead. I, I want to say to Archimedes. Archimedes developed the idea of the center of mass. So if you have a bunch of mass spread out on a balance beam and it's it's balanced, that is the same as if you have all that mass at the center. Um, this will come up later for us. <sighs> Who cares about anything else? Skip to like Kepler. Kepler is looking at the motions of the planets and he's like, there's something forcing these planets to go around and around and around. Mass is attracted to each other. Kepler suggested that if you took two masses and removed all the space and everything around them and they just existed, they would be pulled toward each other. Mass is attractive. And then you have Galileo and Galileo starts dropping things off buildings and finding that they fall at the same rate and the rate with which you fall is related to the height that you've been dropped. And then Newton. And Newton's the big guy in this game of mass and dynamics and all this stuff. Newton took Kepler's ideas and he took Galileo's ideas and he was like, Mwah. except he would never because Newton thought sex was disgusting and against God. Can I just say that like Newton is a really, really weird guy? Here's a fun little argument he had with Rene Descartes. So Rene Descartes is a philosopher, like a natural philosopher, and I will be very vulnerable and say I really struggle to understand what philosophers mean when they say things. Here's a quote from Rene Descartes. Uh, Descartes was studying expanse, like what a body is like in space. He developed the Cartesian coordinate system, you know, Descartes, Cartesian, so like the X, Y, Z, three dimensions. And he did that to study expanse as like a philosophical natural history thing. Here's this quote, which I think means Descartes is saying like, if I'm in space and my body moves, I could move to the edge of space. And if I'm standing looking at the edge of space and I see nothing, I could stick my arm out. And then I wouldn't be at the edge of space anymore because I stuck my arm out. So what is expanse? I, I think that's what he's saying. I, I would love to hear from a philosopher in the comments. <laughs> Um, and then Newton replies like, what are you, some kind of atheist? You don't think God in all his natural wonder and beauty could make an end of space? How, how dare you? And it's just very funny. I think of Newton in terms of his achievements of like, oh, he's got this giant brain and he's just solving the world around him. But if you read anything he's ever written, don't meet your heroes. That's all I have to say. Newton took Kepler's ideas and he took Galileo's ideas and he was like, Mwah. And he developed the theory of gravitation. He said, mass is attractive, things fall at the same time. That's because there is a force of gravitation. And the equation for gravitation looks like this, where you have some gravitational constant, the mass of the two bodies over the distance between those two bodies squared. Look at this beautiful, look at this beautiful law of gravitation. He also developed his laws of dynamics. Right, you have the first one, which concerns inertia, which he related to mass. He says a body has some inertia, and if it's going some velocity, it will keep going that velocity until acted upon by a force. If it's stationary, it will remain stationary until acted upon by a force. His second law, the sum of the forces on a body is equal to mass of that body times the acceleration of that body. So if you apply a force to an object, it will accelerate. If the mass of that object is higher, it will accelerate less than if the mass was lower. So if you have F equals MA, and the only force on an object is the gravitational force, you can just sub in M Earth times M over R Earth squared equals M times A. You can cancel the masses. You get A equals this whole thing, it's constant, right? The mass of the earth is not changing. The radius of the earth is not changing in between you dropping things. So that's why you get like 10 meters per second squared. That's why 
when you drop things, they fall at the same rate, they hit the ground at the same time. Here's a video of someone doing that on the moon. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? So Newton has this idea of inertial mass, where the mass is the thing that prevents you from accelerating, right? F equals ma. The more mass you have, the more force has to be applied to move your body, right? But he also has this idea of gravitational mass, this thing that interacts with the force of gravity. And a fundamental concept in Newtonian dynamics is that these two masses are the same mass, Newton says, there's just one mass, okay? <laughs> there's just one. Inertial mass is the same as gravitational mass. We did it. There's something else in Newtonian mechanics that, that people sometimes forget. Who was the first person to develop the theory of relativity? Galileo, of course. How are you doing on the quiz so far? Galileo, developed this experiment, uh, the thought experiment. He says you're in a ship, like the belly, the bottom of, like under the water, with the, there's no windows, so it's dark. You know in Titanic, the overall guys, you're there. And he says if you're doing physics experiments, like you're dropping balls, you're throwing balls, you're, you're shining a candle at a prism, all of those experiments will have the same results if you are docked and your velocity is zero, or if you are at sea and your velocity is whatever a normal velocity is for a boat, 60 knots. Is that a speed? I don't know. Galileo suggests that physics is relative. We're on the earth moving at some crazy fast speed. We don't notice that speed. The physics behaves by the laws of physics. If you are on a boat at zero and a boat at whatever knots you're going and you're doing those experiments and no one tells you how fast you're going, you cannot calculate what speed you're going unless you are outside like looking at what reference frame you're in, right? The, the rules of physics are true in all reference frames. This is Newtonian dynamics. That's really interesting, right? The Newtonian theory, the Newtonian dynamics accounts for relativity. There is a Galilean transformation, this, that you can make between reference frames. You can be on a dock watching a boat leave, or you can be on the boat and you can move between those frames of reference. All of that is also in relativity. And yet when people talk about relativity, it's in contrast to Newtonian dynamics, which is a theory of relativity. Words are important. No one thinks about words anymore. And physics, after this point was like, oh my gosh, forces. People are like, what if there is more than one force? What if, what if there's something else besides gravity? And of course, we're skipping all a lot of stuff to say, and then we develop a theory of the electromagnetic force. We get Coulomb's law in 1775, which looks like this. Look at what it looks like. Look at gravity. See how they're very, very similar? You have the constant K, you have the two charges. You see how there's charge instead of mass in the electromagnetic force, that's interesting. And you have the same R squared. So if you have two charges, you can calculate the force from this charge onto this charge based on their distance. You know, Newton's third law that equal and opposite, so the force from this onto this object is, is the same but with a negative sign, neat. And this development of the electromagnetic force was coming up on the heels of Newton's optics, which I didn't mention at all, but of course he's got his little prisms and he's hanging out alone in his bedroom because he's Newton. He developed this corpuscular theory of light, um, which is a disgusting word, but he says light is a little particle and it's bouncing around and we can, we can do dynamics of that particle just like we do dynamics of moving bodies. Inside all of Newton's theories was also this idea of ether, ether, ether? He came up with this corpuscular theory of light and said, light is a particle, it's traveling. It can't travel through empty space. And because it gets from the sun to us, there must be something all over. This invisible fluid that the particles of light swim in and 
his dynamics works with that theory. And for 300 years and every single thing I'm going to say until we get to 1905 special relativity, people were like, of course the ether, of course we have to understand the ether. So we have Coulomb's law and we have these two forces, gravity and electromagnetism. And I'm skipping a whole bunch of stuff to say in the 1860s to like the 1880s, Maxwell writes these equations that completely describe the electrostatic force. They look like this. And in the, he didn't write C's, these are modern versions. So now you have these two forces. You have gravity, which is described by dynamics, and you have the electromagnetic force, which is completely described by Maxwell's equations. And from that, you can, you can start doing, doing physics and stuff. So let's go through a timeline from Maxwell to the theory of relativity. And you might say, well, why we're talking about mass? Why would we talk about electromagnetism? Why, why would we? Because the mass in electromagnetism is charge and not really mass. But you'll find out we're like on a journey together. It's going to be fun. In 1881, J.J. Thompson, who discovered the electron, found out via experiment that a charged body is harder to move than an uncharged one. Do you see how fast we got there? He suggests there is some sort of electromagnetic mass. And if you have charge, you have more electromagnetic mass than if you are uncharged, which, you know, according to Newton, the more mass you have, the harder you are to move. So in 1893, Thompson finds that the limit, the absolute fastest you can go is the speed of light. And I'm going to pause to say that what I'm about to say, Thompson's discovery is not correct. So do not leave this video thinking you get more massive when you go faster. Do not. I mean, normally I would do the video and I would be like, haha, Thompson was wrong. You, you don't get more massive. But I just, I don't want you to stop watching here and be like, you get more massive when you go faster because you don't, you do not. Okay. That's, 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 that's the aside. So Thompson in 1893 says the absolute limit is C. The absolute fastest you can go is V equals C. And you can't go that fast if you have mass because you get more massive as you go faster. Electromagnetic mass increases with velocity. Searle, another physicist working against Thompson, came up with this equation for electromagnetic mass. See this little beta? Beta stands for V over C. It's the ratio of your speed or an electron's speed compared to the speed of light. We will see this a lot more, especially in relativity. And this is where things get kind of weird. In 1901, Kaufman and Abraham discover via math that it's not really you get more massive with velocity. It's like components of your mass get more massive because, you know, velocity is a vector. So you get like a transverse mass and a longitudinal mass in equations that look like this. So electromagnetic mass depends on velocity with respect to the angle between the electromagnetic force applied to that body and the velocity of that body. So a body like an electron can have two different types of masses depending on what you're talking about. You have this transverse mass and longitudinal mass. And now it's 1902 and Veen, who has like the best name ever, I love it. Veen suggests, you know what? There's no gravitational mass. All mass, there's one mass, <laughs> is electromagnetic mass, Veen says in 1902. He says, there's no gravitational mass. All mass is given to particles by the electromagnetic force. And it's got these multiple components, longitudinal and transverse mass. And just a side note, if you are an undergrad in physics right now and you plan to take the physics GRE, go to Wikipedia, go to Wien's Law, Wien's Law, look at this plot, look at this equation and just memorize it because there will be three questions on the physics GRE about Wien's Law, even though you never use it. I'm an astronomer and I never use this. Just memorize it. <sighs> the physics GRE is a bad time. I, I think this might be the first grand unified theory, right? In 1902, you have two types of physics. You have gravitational dynamics and you have electromagnetics, right? And Wien says 
all mass is inspired by the electromagnetic force and then you take that mass and it goes into gravity. This is how these theories work together. That's neat, right? I mean, it's wrong, but it's neat. So now it's 1900s to 1904. We're going to talk about Lorentz. Lorentz is doing math, <laughs> as you do, and he discovers that electrons traveling at some speed undergo something called length contraction, the formula for which looks like this. And now we're introducing gamma. Gamma is also something you see a lot in relativity, where beta here is the same beta, V over C. What this says is that an electron moving at a very, very high velocity, like approaching the speed of light, will be contracted in length. And instead of using these big equations to explain transverse mass and longitudinal mass, Lorentz is like, we should think about it in terms of length contraction, like this. And he put this in a paper in 1904, his Lorentz length contraction. Everyone reads this paper with great interest. And in 1905, Abraham from, from the original longitudinal and transverse mass suggests that, well, if this is the case, if length contraction is a thing, then electromagnetism cannot be the only force that gives mass to things. If electromagnetism is the only thing that makes mass and gravity doesn't make mass, if you have a contracted electron, it's going to explode, right? So this idea of length contraction gets rid of the idea that electromagnetism makes all the forces. And Poincaré comes out in 1905 and says a very similar thing. He's like, well, if electromagnetic mass is all mass, then no mass actually exists. Poincaré, bringing up the ether, which he was absolutely obsessed with, said, okay, if electromagnetism is the thing that makes mass have mass, then no mass actually exists. It's just fluctuations in the ether. And this was a problem for him. And so he suggested, I agree with Lorentz, there has to be another type of mass. It can't just be electromagnetic mass. So in his 1905 paper, Poincaré, where he says, you know what? If electromagnetic mass is the only mass, then there is no mass at all. I don't like this. He wrote down this equation. The total energy is going to be the electromagnetic energy plus some other type of energy. And this energy makes mass. Poincaré wrote this down. E equals mc squared. He also took Lorentz's idea of length contraction and he developed what he called Lorentz transformations, which look very, very similar to the Galilean transformations, right? Except in the Galilean transformations, time is time, no matter what reference frame you're in. Like if you have a clock, it's going to be the same if you're on the boat, if you're in space, if you're on the dock, right? In the Lorentz transformation, you get proper time, where if you are going to move from reference frame to reference frame, you need to account for the change in time. Time is not experienced in the same way by every observer. This is, this is weird, right? It's 1905. Um, we have beta. We have the Lorentz transformation from reference frame. We have length contraction and time dilation. We have the concept of time being different for observers in different reference frames. Poincaré has developed an energy mass equivalence, of course, only for photons. And I have not mentioned the name Einstein at all. All of this is still inside ether theory. All of this is building on Newtonian dynamics. And it is 1905. And the, the issue here is the ether theory, right? Poincaré is trying to measure the speed of the ether. He's trying to develop a transformation so he can develop a tool to measure the speed of the ether. Lorentz is doing a similar thing. How does the ether affect the mass of a particle? How does it affect the force felt by a particle? The problem that even Poincaré notices is that with his Lorentz transformations, the ether does not matter. He's, he realizes, and he writes this in a paper, that the ether is now inconsequential because we could just go to a reference frame without the ether and it doesn't matter. The speed of the ether doesn't matter. And if he had just thrown that ether idea away and decided there's no ether, ether? I'm sorry. He would have he would have done relativity, but he didn't. Einstein did. 
Einstein threw away the ether and in his 1905 paper, he starts with two things. He says, one, the speed of light is constant. We'll call it C. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light. And two, the laws of physics are obeyed in every single reference frame. It does not matter how fast you are going, you must obey the laws of physics. And from that, he can derive the Lorentz transformations. He can get time dilation and he can get length contraction out. From that, he gets a mass energy equivalence, which he writes down as E naught, the rest mass of a body equals MC squared. He says all mass is made up of energy, the mass energy equivalence. And that's the theory of special relativity in 1905. And that's how we got there. Now, why is there this confusion about mass? And it's because in Einstein's 1905 paper, he pulls out the the, the, the longitudinal and the transverse masses. And he's like, well, here they are. And then later he just uses mass. And in future papers, like in his 1906 paper, he says, instead of E naught equals MC squared, he says E equals MC squared. And he says, there's a relativistic mass where you can account for the velocity of a particle. And physicists at the time didn't really like Einstein's theory of relativity. They weren't so quick to throw away the ether. When Einstein won his Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect, not relativity, not mass energy equivalence, none of that stuff, they very specifically were like, this is for the photoelectric effect. Perhaps if relativity, if anything comes out of it, like maybe you would get another prize. This is not for that, which I think is very funny. Einstein kind of spent the rest of his life trying to teach the public and new physicists, like people who are just starting their physics research journeys, the importance of relativity. He developed these, this is the German word for thought experiment, and he was trying to convince the people the importance of E equals MC squared. I would like to do one of those for you now. To start by drawing a system of two particles on a space-time diagram, which sounds scarier than it actually is. So on the x-axis you have space, and on the y-axis you have time, and I will have a yellow particle and a red particle. And they will be a distance 2d apart, which means if this is 0, this is d, and this is minus d. Okay? On a space-time diagram, even if you're standing still, you still have to move forward in time. So we will move forward, and at some time t, this particle is going to emit a photon. So that's gamma, which means its mass will change. So if both of these guys were a mass m at t equals zero, this yellow particle now has a mass minus of m minus delta m. And because of the conservation of momentum, if this guy emits a particle, it can't keep going in the same position, so it has to start moving along the x-axis. So it'll be here and keep going. Now the red particle doesn't know what happened to that particle when that particle emitted a photon because the photon takes time to travel. So here its mass is still m. When it gets hit by this photon, it will absorb it and its mass will become m plus delta m. And again, because of the conservation of momentum, once it gets hit by this photon, it will start moving in some direction. Okay, so there are two important times on this diagram. You have T1, when the photon was emitted, and you have T2 when the photon was absorbed. I want to calculate the change in energy from that yellow particle. To do that, I'm going to use that Archimedes principle of the center of mass from like, what was it, like 300? The year 300, I think? So the center of mass principle says that if you add up the masses times the distance from the center of mass, they will all sum to zero. And this will be true for any system of particles. And I can do this at time t2. Because the yellow particle is traveling to the left and the red particle is traveling to the right, these two will sum to zero. So I can put one on either side of the equation. So I will start with the red particle, which has a mass of m plus delta m time t2. And it hasn't moved at this time when it absorbs the photon, so its distance is still d. 
On the other side, I have the yellow particle, which has a mass m minus delta m. And it is not a distance d from the origin at t2, right? Um, it's distance d here plus whatever this distance is. And we can solve for that because we know that distance is velocity times time. And I can actually solve for the time because that time is t2 minus t1. And we can use our photon to determine what that time is, right? Because a photon has a velocity of c. And we know that time is equal to the distance traveled over v. So the distance this photon travels is 2d over c. No. <laughs> so the time that this photon has traveled to get to t2 is 2d over c. So I can write that. I'm going to stop color coding these, but we can do like algebra now, right? We get md plus delta m d equals m minus delta m times d oops, plus m minus delta m times v 2d over c. Now this is momentum, a mass times a velocity. So we can solve for the momentum and we get p times 2d over c is equal to md plus delta md. And we move this to the other side and we can split that apart and we get minus md plus delta md. So these two cancel and we get p, which is the momentum, it's right there, sorry, 2d over c equals 2 delta m times d. So we can cancel the 2d and we get p equals delta m c. Except we know that the energy of a photon is the momentum of that photon times c. So we get e equals delta m c squared. So this is Einstein's thought experiment, right? You have two particles. One emits a photon, the other absorbs it. Because the photon was required for the change in mass, what is the energy of that photon? Look, we have an energy mass equivalence. This is not a proof of relativity. This is just an example that shows the equivalence of energy and mass. And even, even this example, like I'm only using a photon, I'm not showing like a proton and an antiproton, like colliding and releasing all their mass and energy. I'm just showing one little thing. And this is what Einstein did when he took E naught equals MC squared, which is always correct. A body at rest always has some amount of energy. And he tried to translate it to something more accessible and digestible to the public. And he got to E equals MC squared, which he thought was prettier, but is only true in cases like this problem where that's what you're solving for. Do you understand? If the only thing you take from relativity is E equals MC squared, and I ask you, what's the energy of a photon? You would say, well, photons don't have mass. So E equals zero C squared, which is not true, right? And there's something else that you can get from E equals mc squared, which is wrong. You know from relativity that the universal speed limit is c. You can never go faster than c. So if you look at E equals mc squared, you might say like, oh, but I could add energy. So what happens when I add energy? Oh, the mass goes up. And you get so massive, you can never go faster than c. And that's just incorrect. A lot of people think that when you go faster, you get more massive. And that is because people think E equals MC squared is a physics law, that it is always true. And it is not always true. What is always true is this equation that includes this momentum factor. This is what happens when you go faster, right? The mass does not change when you go faster. If you reduce this to E equals MC squared, you, you start making mistakes like that. This is always true. This is also always true, and this one is a nice little fun one that talks about the mass energy equivalence. This is what we should use. Okay, I'm interjecting here because I just did a problem where I was like, this is just a thought experiment about relativity, but I thought it would be important to show the importance of relativity by doing a problem where relativity is essential.
when cosmic rays, which are just protons, don't let the physics establishment lie to you, when these cosmic rays hit the upper atmosphere, a bunch of reaction happens, but one of those reactions results in the creation of muons. Now in the lab, we have measured the speed and the lifetime of muons. So it's very short lived and it moves really, really fast. The issue is that these particles are created in the upper atmosphere, like 10 kilometers from Earth, and yet we measure them on Earth. So in classical mechanics, distance equals velocity times time, right? If you take the lifetime and multiply it by the velocity, you get that the muon should only be able to travel 0.6 kilometers, which is much, much less than the 10 kilometers required for us to actually measure it on the ground, except we do measure it on the ground. So classical mechanics must not be good enough to solve this problem. So we must go to relativity. So let's look at it from the observer's perspective. Okay. Uh, at T1, which equals zero, the muons are created. At T2, which is tau, the muons, that's the end of their lifetime. They will annihilate or whatever they're going to do. So our equation for time dilation is this. And we know gamma because we, we know beta, right? Beta is just V over C. So we get one over one minus 0.999. I don't need to write all this algebra, do I? <laughs> Times tau. And we just do that math and we get 42 kilometers. Now 42 kilometers is bigger than 10 kilometers. So from the observer's perspective, the lifetime of the muon is dilated, it can last longer in its reference frame because it's going so fast and it can hit the ground and we can measure it, which is good because we actually do measure it. Um, let's look at it from the muon's perspective. Um, in the muon's perspective, t its time does not dilate. In the muon's perspective, the distance from the atmosphere to the crust of the earth where the observer is, ooh, crust sounds weird, where the observer is, is shortened, it's contracted, length contraction, okay? So according to the muon, it experiences a different atmospheric thickness, which we can calculate using the length contraction. So we have gamma, which again is this, I don't need to write it again. And here, the primed reference frame is our reference frame where we experience 10 kilometers. And we get that the muon actually experiences 0.14 kilometers. The muon travels through an atmosphere that for us is 10 kilometers deep, for the muon is only 0.14 kilometers. So even though its lifetime is 10 to the minus 6 seconds or whatever, it can travel that distance because 0.4 kilometers is bigger, or <laughs> no, because 0.14 kilometers is less than 0.6 kilometers. So when you're dealing with things that are moving very, very quickly, classical mechanics is just not good enough. Classical mechanics gives you the wrong answer, right? Classical mechanics would say the muon could never get here. And our experience is that, but we observe them, we can catch them, we, we can see them. And classical mechanics would be like, it must be something else. But with relativity, we can get the actual answer and we can explain why the muons reach our detectors even though their lifetime is so short. Relativity is very important. It's very good. Okay, thanks for indulging my my, my tablet math. So there we are in 1905. Relativity is really important for experimentalists. The theorists aren't as willing to give up the ether theory. That's fine. They certainly will. All of quantum mechanics, this huge revolution in physics happens because of relativity. Did you know we didn't know how stars work? This is unrelated, but Stars use this energy mass principle, right? You take two hydrogen atoms and you swing them together and you get a helium out and a whole bunch of energy. And that's how stars work. And we didn't know until the theory of relativity. In, in 1915, Einstein publishes his general theory of relativity where he says E naught equals MC squared again. And he talks, of, it's about gravity. He talks about mass and there's one mass. There's just one mass. In 1921, Wolfgang Pauli writes this book which is Einstein approved. And he talks a lot about relativistic mass and rest mass and how it, you can't go faster than the speed of light. And so it's almost like you get more massive. You don't get more massive when you move. It's fine. 
And this ends up being the textbook almost that every single physicist who learns relativity uses until like 1970. Um, by the way, Wolfgang Pauli was born in the year 1900, so he was five when Einstein wrote his theory of relativity, and he was 21 when he finished his PhD and wrote this. Another thing about Wolfgang Pauli, right? Right, has anyone noticed this? In this book, Wolfgang Pauli completely dispenses with the transverse mass and the longitudinal mass of electromagnetics. He's like, no. So we're down to two. We're down to two masses. And it's interesting because in the textbook, people talk about relativistic mass and rest mass. But when you're doing physics, all the particle physicists of the time just had one mass. And in fact, here's a quote from Einstein where he's like, this is confusing. There's just one mass. There's one mass. There's one mass. Mass is an intrinsic property that won't change. And Einstein knew this. And he knew it in 1941. And Wolfgang Pauli also knew this. But that's, that's not how they taught their classes. I thought it would be funny if I made a whole video on the concept of mass without ever defining it, but I'm gonna define it. And I'm gonna use Stephen Hawking's definition where he says, mass, the quantity of matter in a body, it's inertia or it's resistance to acceleration. Is there a definition in this book for rest mass or relativistic mass or longitudinal mass or gravitational mass or inertial mass? No, there's just one mass. Stephen Hawking, he knows what he's talking about. He wrote a book. So mass is an intrinsic property of a body, which means if you move it from reference frame to reference frame, it's not changing. The only way to change mass is to change the internal energy of a body. And so like, obviously you can do that, but you do not change the internal energy of a body by moving it faster. So if I wanna change my mass, I could stop eating so much candy and start running six miles a week or something, right? If I wanted to change my mass, I could cut off my arm, but taking me onto an airplane where I'm going 600 miles an hour does not change my mass, right? A flower, no, a plant, can change its mass by growing, right? It has water, it has nutrients from soil, and it has sunlight, and it can make carbs and stuff, right? It will grow. That changes the internal energy. That will change the intrinsic value of the mass. Here's a tricky one. If you take an iron, like an old-timey iron made, made of metal, and you put it in the fire, and you heat it up, and you get a little stick and you start ironing your clothes with the hot iron, the hot iron weighs more than it does when it's room temperature. You've heated up the little molecules inside of it. They're bouncing around. The internal energy has gone up. It weighs like 10 to the minus 12 kilograms, an, an, an unmeasurable amount for a normal human more, okay? And when it cools back down, those molecules slow back down, the heat escapes to the room and it weighs less. You've changed the internal energy. But throwing that hot iron at 0.97c does, does not increase its mass. The only way to change mass is to change the internal energy. Mass is an intrinsic property. There's only one mass. m naught is not a thing that should exist. E equals mc squared leads to the conclusion E naught equals m naught c squared. And then you have two m's and it doesn't make any sense. That's the problem. I've said it a couple different ways now. So <laughs> this equation, is the correct one. I think it's time to talk about modern mass, but I will tell you that it makes me a little, I get a little existential dread if I think about particle physics too much. I will be brave for the concept of mass. I'm gonna speed through it though. <laughs> okay, if you have a hydrogen atom, no. Is it a deutron? When you, it's a high, it's a heavy hydrogen. It's got one proton, one neutron, an electron, okay? This is mass, right? There's an intrinsic measure of mass, which I can tell you is this value. You measure the mass of particles in EV, which is a, which is a unit of energy, right? There's an energy mass equivalence, isn't that neat? Someone should write a paper about that. But if you want to get down to the tiniest tiny mass, you would throw a bunch of energy at this called the ionization energy and you would kick off the electron. The funny thing is that the energy of this atom is less 
then the energy of the nucleus, the proton and the neutron together, and the electron as a system. This has more mass. And that's because you had to throw energy in to separate these two things. Okay, now let's look at the nucleus. This is still mass, right? A proton and a neutron. If I want to break this nucleus, of, nucleus. <laughs> if I want to break this nucleus apart, you gotta throw energy at it. The nuclear binding energy, the energy that is keeping these two things together. You throw some energy at it and you break it apart. And again, the mass of these two things together is less than the mass of a proton and a neutron just hanging out. And this isn't the end of the story, right? Because a neutron's not stable. The neutron half-life is like 15 minutes, like 800 seconds, I think. So your neutron just hanging out is not gonna hang out as a neutron for longer than what, like 30 minutes? It's statistical, there's a Gaussian probably. What's gonna happen is it's gonna undergo beta decay because neutrons and protons are hadrons. There he is, Lev Oaken, they're hadrons. They're made up of more than two quarks. They're made up of three quarks. A quark is the smallest constituent of matter and they have very stupid names. So a proton is like two ups and a down and I'm not even gonna look it up because I hate it so much. That's right, Gelman. Why would you name them up and down? Your name is Gelman. It should be a Gel and a Mon. A neutron's two Gels and a Mon. How did you miss this up and down, strange and charm, top and bottom? We don't like it. Why did everything start getting named so poorly in the 1960s? You know what holds the quarks together? Gluons. Get it? Anyway, baby decay. So uh, I'm gonna show you a Feynman diagram for beta decay. Looks like this. You've got your neutron, it's three quarks. Uh, this is space time plot, right? So it's moving forward in time. No, moving up in time. And it is going to emit a W boson and you're gonna get an electron out and a little anti-electron neutrino. And that neutron ha now has three quarks, which make it a proton. And the electron has to come out to conserve charge, which means that the neutron has a mass that's a little bit higher than a proton because it's it's got to be able to turn into an electron and a proton all right i don't i don't like it. so you zoom in on your single proton which is very stable remarkably stable the lifetime of the universe stable and inside the proton are the three quarks and all the gluons which are massless particles that are just energy keeping all this together Okay, so a proton, which makes up everything, even the neutrons, all the mass, is three quarks and some gluons. And this is what I don't, it makes me, I don't know, does anyone else experience just like this anxiety when you think about this? The energy of a proton has this value. The energy of a single quark has this value. 1% of the proton is mass. Mass as we think of it. 1%. The rest is energy. I don't like it. It's hard. I don't. It just kind of creeps me out a little bit. Like everything you know and touch and love is just energy balled up together. And like I know from the energy mass equivalent that that has to be the case. And like maybe I'm just a pathetic philosopher and I can't handle thinking about big things, but the idea that all the protons are just 1% mass, it's weird for me. But anyway, good news. Our idea that mass is just one thing and mass is just, is just mass. A, a quark, the smallest bit of mass we have. Guess what? If you accelerate a quark, well, a quark can't be by itself. It is fine. Pretend you could get a quark by yourself and you could move it on a train going 600 meters per second. Would that quark have more mass because it's going faster? No, because velocity does not change your mass, which is an intrinsic property, which means the rest energy of that quark is mc squared and the energy, the total energy, you can throw in the velocity term and get a kinetic energy out. It's totally fine. Okay, we're there, we're all here. We're all here now, right? Where E equals MC squared is not the most best. It's not always correct. Well, this is always, always, always correct and should be the one people think of. Okay, so now here we are. We have what Levo can refer to as a pyramid. A pyramid in academia, not again. We're at the bottom. You have E equals MC squared. And this is like, 
public books, like like a book you would buy in an airport because you wanted to read about physics, but you don't have a physics background, like this book. I'm not saying this book is bad, it's, it's a good book. So you buy this book and you learn a little bit about physics, but it says E equals MC squared, right? And there are millions of copies of this book floating around where people learn that E equals MC squared, right? And then you go to the next level on the pyramid and it's all four of these equations floating around together. And you learn physics from Pauli or you learn physics from Feynman. They talk about relativistic mass and rest mass and all four of these equations, even though they disagree with each other and there's no consistency, are used. And you kind of just have to learn which, when it's appropriate to use which ones. And then you go to the top of the equation where you have like papers written by particle physicists. So while the bottom is millions of people reading Stephen Hawking, the top is like a thousand people <laughs> who write papers like once a year about physics and they only have one mass, only ever one mass because there is only one mass and they would only use this equation. And that's the issue, right? The public and students learn relativity incorrectly and so you have this interim phase where people are like oh okay well here's relativistic mass i guess and then you have the physics where stuff actually happens where you only use the one equation because it's the correct one so let me take you on a journey through a physics degree okay you start this book is huge <laughs> you start with general like university physics like if you're a chemistry major you'll take this physics if you're a medical doctor you would have taken this physics it's just like your basic college level physics if you get to relativity which you may not you will just learn how to do like simple algebra Lorentz contractions and you will learn e equals mc squared and you might think that if you go faster you weigh more this book does not say if you go faster, you weigh more. The idea is that you learn E equals MC squared, but you don't actually learn when it's applicable or why it's used. And you come to the incorrect conclusion about relativity, right? And then you move on. Oh gosh. <laughs> Modern physics is everything after classical physics. So 1905, you have relativity, you have quantum mechanics, you have statistical mechanics, you have QCD and QFT and all that stuff. In modern physics, they mention relativistic mass and they have the equation, but they do it historically. And you don't do any problems with it, but you don't actually learn that it's wrong. And then you have ENA. Again, you might be confused why is mass even relevant in ENA, but we, we learned all that. We learned how these theories are intimately related. And in Baby's first ENM course, relativistic mass is mentioned and it says this is not in favor anymore and this is the last time you hear about it so those first three or four years of physics you are in the middle of that pyramid where it's all kind of nebulously coexisting and you're like okay okay and then you go to graduate school and you take baby's first particle physics course and there's one mass because you know actually there is just one mass and you you take the actual ENM course and you learn relativity because you learn relativity in ENM and there's just one mass because you know what there's actually just one mass and you're at the top of the pyramid and you're done and then you're confused when you give public talks when no one knows what you're talking about unless you say E equals MC squared. Why is this the case? Well because when relativity got popular Einstein was saying E equals mc squared. Einstein approved this book where he says E equals mc squared even though when he wrote this book he says E naught equals mc squared and even though we have this quote where Einstein says there is one mass and if you have the more than one mass it's confusing we, we still as a public watch people talk about E equals mc squared. I don't usually watch videos about a topic before I make the video because I feel like I would just steal jokes and that would be lame. But I do search to see if it's been done a bunch before. Like, um, I wanted to do a video on Faraday's candle because I really like Faraday and this is a really good lecture. Um, but I looked it up on YouTube and, and someone spent a lot of time making like a 10 video series and I mean, I can't compete with that. So I mean, just watch that one, I guess. But when I searched, Lev Oken and I searched e equals mc squared, a bunch of videos came up and all the physicists were like, oh, here's the controversy. 
Here's why we still use A equals MC squared. I don't agree with that. Here's a video from Fermilab, you know, professional particle physicists who are at the top of this pyramid. And Dr. Don Lincoln is like, here's why we still use rest mass and rest energy, because it's good for teaching. And even though I never use it in my work ever, not at all, and it's confusing to think about it that way, it's good for teaching. And here's a video of Brian Crane. Oh, by the way, Brian Green wrote the introduction to this book, which was republished for the Einstein year, like the 100th anniversary of his miracle year in 1905. And in this book, the text of the book, Einstein talks about E naught equals MC squared. In the introduction, Brian Green talks about E equals MC squared. And also he wrote the introduction as if relativity was this like paradigm shift in physics and the next paradigm shift was string theory. <laughs> In this video, Brian Greene, it's, it's 2020, so it's like a pandemic joint. Brian Greene is doing equations, and he's talking about E equals MC squared. And at the start, he's like, some physicists don't like that I'm using E equals MC squared. He's talking about this argument right here, the argument we're in right now. And he's like, but I'm going to tell you why I use it. It's for teaching. It's helpful for teaching. I don't think it's helpful or useful to teach relativity as E equals MC squared because it leads to those misconceptions about what relativity is. And you have to be corrected when you go to graduate school. <sighs> I'm not saying Brian Greene or Dr. Don Lincoln are bad at physics, okay? Don't take this that way. I'm not. Like, obviously both of those people who use relativity in their day-to-day -day lives every day understand relativity. The disagreement is in the semantics of how we teach relativity. So let me talk about lying to children. When you teach people complicated topics, sometimes you just lie to their face, like the Bohr model of the atom. This is not what an atom looks like, but it's very helpful to think about the nucleus deep inside with the electrons orbiting around. And it's nice to think of the electrons as very smooth point particles. And this is really helpful for understanding chemical bonds and molecular bonds and noticing why the periodic table has the properties it does, right? This is the type of lie you tell high school kids and then you take them to advanced physical chemistry when they're a senior in college and you're like, oh, well, that's not exactly true. All of the knowledge you get from the Bohr model is true and accurate, right? That's the difference. Um, I already, I lied to you in this video. I was like, here's beta decay. Look at this Feynman diagram. This, this is not beta decay. Uh, the Feynman diagram is a tool used to visualize the math. The math of beta decay is a bunch of matrices, like pages and pages of matrices, because beta decay can be beta plus or beta minus. It doesn't have just one Feynman diagram. There are a bunch. And the diagram is just helpful for when you're doing your pages of algebra. Like, I could do the math. I could do the math. I could do the math. But am I going to understand what's going on unless I have this little picture in my head of what's going on? Right? It's just very helpful. But sometimes this idea that we lie to children about early science can have negative effects. I think about evolution. If you are in sixth grade and you are learning evolution for the first time and your teacher says species evolve to be better adapted to their environment, that's not true, right? Evolution is random. The genetic change is a random process. And if you are able to have babies before you die from whatever that genetic change was, it will carry on. It doesn't make the species better. God is playing dice, right? There's there's no there's no will towards a better species. Like think of something like sickle cell anemia. It is a devastating disease. It is bad for you, but because you can have children before you get really sick, it carried on and lots of people still have sickle cell anemia. If you learn evolution as species evolve to get better, you have a whole misconception about what evolution is. You might think that survival of the fittest means the better species wins. You might think humans are evolving to be smarter, even though there's no evidence of that. Imagine there is a global pandemic with a virus spreading still to this day, and you think, oh, evolution makes species better. You might think this virus has to evolve 
to have a higher R value and a lower fatality rate because that would be better for the virus to survive longer. And it's just like, no, the virus doesn't have to evolve to anything. It can evolve to have a higher R value. It can evolve to have a lower fatality or it can do the reverse or it can do both. It has nothing to do with what the virus wants. No one's guiding evolution. But if you learn it in sixth grade as getting better, evolving to be better, you will carry this misconception with you for your entire life. And with much lower stakes. <laughs> I think if you learn E equals MC squared is relativity, you carry those misconceptions that mass depends on velocity for the rest of your life and you don't understand relativity. You don't have a good idea of what relativity means. You don't understand the energy mass equivalence contains another component of energy. Kinetic energy is separate from internal energy, your frame will change kinetic energy. Your frame of reference does not change your internal energy. And if you take Wolfgang Pauli's relativity course, you will leave with that misconception. And unless you go to graduate school for physics, which you know what, not, not that many people do, you're not going to be corrected. And you're going to be carrying your incorrect ideas about evolution and your incorrect ideas about relativity for the rest of your life. This is where Brian Greene and Don Lincoln are on the team that is against mine. I'm not saying they're bad at physics. I'm saying I don't agree with how they're teaching physics to the people, to the viewers of popular science videos. E equals MC squared is not the most best. It would be so much easier and so much more helpful if we just added a little not. E not equals MC squared. Mass is an intrinsic property. This was the concept of mass. You said relativistic mass isn't a thing, but it's in my textbook here. See, it, it's on Wikipedia. Are you telling me that Brian Greene, celebrity string theorist, knows less about relativity than you, a YouTuber? But I'm a medical doctor and I took the one required physics course to get into medical school. And so I learned all of relativity because I am a medical doctor and I learned that when you're going really fast, you get more massive and that's why you can't go the speed of light. I learned that in school. Guys, I think this woman is an idiot because here's a video of literally Albert Einstein saying e equals mc squared. Furthermore, the equation e is equal mc squared. <sighs> why do we even watch this? 